Welcome to the Living After Faith Podcast, a podcast designed to help you as you leave religion and move forward with your life. We are the official podcast of RecoveringReligionists.com, a recovery group founded by Dr. Daryl Ray, the author of The God Virus. We welcome your feedback. You can contact us by going to LivingAfterFaith.com at Facebook.com slash LivingAfterFaith and follow us on Twitter at LAF with me. And now here's today's program on Living After Faith with Rich and Deanna Joy Lyons. Come laugh with us. So we are talking to a very special guest today. We have uh, probably one of the most famous apostates that you could probably talk to. Nate Phelps is a son of the Westboro Baptist Church's leader, Fred Phelps. He is one of uh, just a couple of children that escaped from that situation, and he has come to tell us his story today. Uh, he's currently living in Canada and working for the Center for Inquiry, doing wonderful things with them. And before we uh, put Nate on, I want to first say we put on our Facebook wall What question would you ask Nate Phelps? And we got a few questions and we'll ask those. But overwhelmingly in my inbox was people saying, you're getting Nate Phelps. Tell him he's awesome. Tell him congratulations. Tell him what a uh, just give him accommodation or accommodations for the fact that he had the courage at such a young age to make such a huge step and has stayed with it. The example you have said is incredible, and we want to start with that. You are awesome. Thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate that. We're impressed. Yeah, Knowing what Rich has gone through, I have a better idea of what other people have gone through in their coming out stories as well. And uh, boy, it's just really great. I think I would just like to say here, because uh, sometimes there's a, there's a bit of a false perception out there that, you know, when I left on my 18th birthday, there was a large part of me that that sincerely believed that what my father had taught was true and that I was going to hell. And and so there was a lot of uh, kind of stuffed fear and anxiety. But uh, the broader point is it's a process. It, it took years in, of me clinging to other versions of, of the faith my ta- father taught, um, dealing with those doubts, asking a lot of questions. Um, and, you know, I, I want to mention that because I think that for a lot of people out there, that's probably what their process looks like as well, more or less. And and that's okay as far as I'm concerned. That's that's really the best way to do it is to ask a lot of questions, do a lot of reading, challenge the ideas that are out there. Uh, it's not, I mean, I, I probably had a, several what I would call epiphany moments during that journey. But it was a journey. It wasn't a specific moment. Can you get us inside the head of 18-year-old Nate Phelps when he was making these decisions and how you came to the decisions to make that that just huge step? Yeah, I can try to. I would say probably the most profound component of all that was fear and confusion when I was 18 or, you know, approaching that age because year after year after year of having this message pounded into you and... The fact that I was, of all of the children, I was I was the one who challenged my father as much as one could challenge, you know, someone like my father. There was a lot of passive aggressive going on there, and that cost me dearly because you know the message I got in response to that was that I was evil and that I was um, a son of Belial was one of his popular terms that he used for me. So, uh, and you you take that in. So you know there was a strong sense of of me being bad and, and, you know, what was wrong with me and that kind of stuff. So that created a lot of confusion. And at 18, you know, I don't know if you guys can remember when you were 18, but that's kind of the nature of that age. You know, you're kind of trying to figure out the world and, and we're not the brightest at that point in our lives. And so that's kind of, well, that was the backdrop. And, you know, like I, you know, there was a certainty um, that my father was, right that I was going to hell. I, I remember sitting in the in the church pew one Sunday night as I was thinking about this and uh, did the math. And I thought, okay, well, my, my dad had taught us that Christ was going to return around the year 2000. So that means that I have until I'm 42 to live my life and I'll deal with the consequences then. So, you know, those were some of the thoughts that I had. Uh, but overwhelmingly there was this determination that that I could free myself from his clutches and from his absolute control and authority over you know the lives of his children and 
that was a strong impetus that I clung to as I was, you know, making the practical preparations to get out of there. When did you finally start feeling that you had, in fact, broken that grip that he held on you? That's actually a very good question. I, you know, in in some regards, I still don't know if I have completely broken it. Uh, again, it, it's a long process. Uh, you know, over the years, especially when after I got married and started having my own, you know, I had my own children and and was dealing with that relationship between father and, and child from the other side, you know, that, that was a kind of a breakout period for me because it raised a tremendous amount of questions. And I would have, you know, I talk about this in my book that I would have just hours at night of angry, violent confrontations in my mind with my father as I was challenging a lot of these ideas that, that he had pounded into our heads. So it was a process, you know, I would deal with one specific aspect of it and I would work it over and I would read books and, and I, you know, new ideas would come out and I would, would uh, argue with him in my mind and, and uh, slowly his grip started weakening as far as, you know, affecting my thoughts and, and my life. So there's still parts of it that uh, I struggle with. Sounds like there was a very strong authoritarian grip on you with that father-son relationship and then you were struggling really hard not to have that same relationship with your own children and I you know I've got to commend you because that's probably one of the bigger things people struggle with is not to repeat the same things that went on in their own childhoods especially when there's abuse involved you know a lot of people experience the abuse and they have a hard time breaking free of it and that it lives with them for a long time did you seek any therapy I did yeah I had two major sessions um early on i was still dealing with the the specific religious questions you know the the theological framework that that i grew up with and i i found a uh counselor who had a psychology degree as well as a theology degree and i spent the better part of a year with him and you know he put me through in his own words about two years worth of uh theological seminary training as far as the the textbooks and that helped me start letting go of this idea that there was only one way to interpret the bible and that uh and that my father had that way because that was just such a huge part of our theology so i got a lot of support that direction with him and then i spent um i went back in in the early 90s and spent a considerable period of time with another counselor and and that ended up i spent two weeks actually in a um a mental hospital, I guess is, that's kind of the rough way of saying it, but um, he had diagnosed me with um, PTSD and, and uh, so I started dealing a lot more with the, the consequences of the physical and uh, psychological abuse that was was uh, a part of growing up there. So Let's talk about that. I was also diagnosed with PTSD and uh, I've had people say everything from oh, well, that's just in your head to uh, people who actually understand. But I think one thing people don't realize is religious abuse is a real valid source of PTSD. And it's no easier getting over it regardless of the source, whether it's from a combat battlefield or uh, from a room with your dad. Yeah, I, and I agree with that. I, I agree with the initial comments that we always have to be careful when we hear terms, you know, it conjures up images or ideas or or thoughts, we have to be careful with that. But there are very real, practical um, symptoms, if you will, conditions that that those terms serve to try to explain to the average person. And those symptoms are what I had to try to, to come to terms with, that knee-jerk emotional reaction that I would have to certain circumstances or events that were going on in my life, where you suddenly become literally paralyzed with fear and for one of a better term, you have inappropriate reactions to the environment around you in the sense that they're destructive, self-destructive or destructive to, you know, those around you. So that was the kind of stuff I was trying to deal with is that I would get scared too easy and then that would lead to um, anger or, uh, you know, well, anger and, and and whatever defense. that looked like. Yeah, those are the kind of things that I was trying to deal with is that I would wake up mornings literally paralyzed with fear and there wasn't anything in the immediate environment that would justify that so um 
you know, trying to, to work through that and understand the source of that. And then, you know, practical ways of dealing with those kind of, of feelings so that you could live, you know, a, a fairly normal life. Now, Rich got a good deal of therapy from a his psychiatrist, and she specialized in PTSD. And I, I think if it weren't for her, he would not be in the place that he is now, able to cope, able to be healthy, able to be happy. No, they would have scooped me out from under the Aurora Bridge with a spatula. Yeah. Really? Hey, yeah. 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 She literally taught me off the bridge. Yeah. And the, wow. Wow. What are some of the specific symptoms and coping mechanisms that you found effective for you? There's the... Um, you know, if something happens in the environment from, um, you know, someone just suggesting something where it suddenly looks like I'm I'm being um, cheated or mistreated, then I would have this, you know, my heart would race, my um, all the alarms that that were a part of growing up in that environment would go off, and I would become very defensive and fearful, and make assumptions about what the intent was of that person or or you know sometimes it was even just a loud sound or if if there was any aggression in my environment even if it didn't have anything to do with me i would immediately internalize it and i would assume that that i was physically at risk because that was the pattern that i saw if my if my old man got angry about something in the environment it didn't have to have anything to do with me and almost inevitably there would be physical or psychological consequences specifically to me because of his anger. So um, I'd say probably the most effective for me throughout my entire adult life has been to literally talk myself down, you know, learn to take deep breaths and to tell myself that this isn't about me, this isn't the same situation, that these are the controls that I have in the situation to prevent harm to myself. So that's kind of a broad overview of, of the training that I got. Can you describe to us the immediate post Westboro Baptist Church, the emotional aspect of cutting the ties with the church and how that affected you? I, I need to start out by reminding you that I was I was uh, in many ways naive and ignorant at that point in my life. And there was a period of time where I was, was elated that I was away from that situation and it's kind of like, you know, if, if parents let go of the, the strings and, and told the kid, just go out and do whatever you want. Uh, you know, there was a lot of really silly decisions and choices I made for the first three or four years. And I finally, things started to settle down and, and I started trying to focus a little bit on, on finding a career and, uh, being a little bit more responsible. You know, one of the things about leaving that situation was, and we knew this, we heard it, you know, ad nauseum from our father that if we left, you know, we're leaving the church of God and, and we're turning our back on God and we're defying him and he's not going to tolerate that and uh, we would be cut off from, you know, the family and from the church. We were ostracized and so there's all the consequences of that. And, you know, as a, as a young person, I thought, yeah, that's just, that's a lot of talk. It really that's not going to happen. Uh, it seemed a lot less dangerous than it se sounded, you know, when you said the words. Uh, but it was a, com you know, virtually a complete disconnect. And, you know, at first it didn't seem to matter, but then you, s you suddenly realize that you don't have the support, you, you know, the psychological or the emotional support. You don't have the financial support. Um, you don't realize how much you come to rely on your family as a, a way to deal with the world. And so when I started dealing with those losses, and the, I have to also say this, you guys, there, it all seemed so normal. I didn't see that there was anything wrong with me. I thought, you know, people would say, I don't know how you're walking around after what you went through. And I no, I fine. You know, there wasn't any consequences to this. I was very naive about that. But looking back on it, I can remember that I would find myself having you know, four, three or four hours would have passed and I was sitting on the sofa and literally was so enraged and screaming inside my head that I was unable to interact with the world around me at all. I was just f furious and self-destructive and angry at the world. And anybody tried to reach out and, and even touch me physically, 
I would, I just couldn't tolerate it. So, you know, there were very real specific physical symptoms that were going on. But to me, that's just the way I was. I didn't attach it to this situation because remember as a child, whatever the situation is, it's in your mind, it's normal. It's the way the world is. So you don't necessarily look at, at the conditions you live in and say, this isn't appropriate. It just is what it is. So it takes a long time to be able to kind of step outside yourself and look at it uh, objectively and say, there's some serious problems here, right? From the day you left on that 18th birthday until Nate Phelps finally started to feel like his own man, his own uh, liberated person from this, how, how long was that process? Well, I would say that I, I became confident and comfortable with uh, expressing my uh, absence of religion probably 2005 so that's a long time you know, that's 30 nearly 30 years but as I've said it was a process and there were stages and I can you know look at specific times like in the early 90s uh, after I had a uh, specific encounter with my kids I made the decision to not expose them to re religious ideas anymore until, you know, basically they chose to pursue it themselves. After 9-11 uh, was a huge step for me because of the whole, you know, what I saw as a very practical issue that we have to deal with as a society where, you know, we were, too many of Americans were more than willing to immediately turn to the exact same illogical thinking to solve the problem of planes flying into buildings as those who flew the planes into the building. So all along the way, there were events, specific events or periods of time where I um, let go of another part of that way of thinking. Yeah, I can, uh, I can remember my own thoughts about religion around 9-11 as well. And I can definitely uh, sympathize with you know, thinking, why is everybody turning to the thing that caused the problem? It's just a different flavor of the thing that caused the problem. Did you at any point try other, I think you alluded to earlier, your other versions of Christianity? Did you try to go from the Fred Phelps version to someone else's version? I did. And, um, you know, some of the initial forays were, were into fairly similar versions where there was still a, a fairly rigid fundamentalist uh, interpretation or, or idea of, of who God was. And then, uh, you know, to a more mainstream, I spent uh, probably f four or five years in a, an evangelical free church uh, when my children were young. And that's the church that I pulled them out of. Um, and then the last few years, when I was confident that I no longer believed and was just getting the confidence to say that more readily to my friends and and, uh, and family. I, I was attending, actually, it was a uh, Calvary Chapel system down there in Southern California that, you know, Chuck Smith started. Right. And his son, Chuck Smith Jr., had a church in, in Capistrano Beach. It was part of the Calvary system, uh, at least initially it was. But, but his son was, he was more of a philosopher than a, a theologian. Really a remarkable young man. And I really enjoyed going and, and listening to him just because he seemed to be pulling away from a lot of the um, popular ideas of who God was and trying to find a more spiritual or, you know, a different way of looking at that without coming right out and saying, you know, I, I wonder sometimes if he's not atheist himself, but I don't know that for a fact. Um, I do know that he ended up being separated from his father, but those were all interim steps. Uh, but by the time I was listening to Chuck Jr., I was convinced and I was having a lot of really rigorous uh, encounters or confrontations with my closest friend down there because she was a devout believer and she was trying to save my life is how she kind of was approaching it because she saw me slipping away and she was terrified that, of the implications of that. And she kept trying to tell me it was because of the, you know, tortured version of who God was that I, I grew up with. And, and I, you know, came to the point where I just challenged her on that because I said, you know, it, it, we're talking about ideas here. And either the ideas that I have about God and theology are legitimate 
or they aren't. It doesn't have anything to do with the path I took to get here. So I, I pretty much reject that idea that I'm reacting to the God my father raised us with. Let's talk about some of the things that you're involved with now. Uh, let's talk about the Center for Inquiry and where things are going, uh, how you got into that and, and where things are going with that. I first found out about the Center for Inquiry about two and a half years ago when I was invited to come and speak in Calgary for the Center and uh, had a really good experience here and we had an after party after my talk and was talking to some of the, the founders and leaders of the CFI here in Calgary and they had suggested that if I ever made my way here that they could really use a new uh, executive director and at that time it just you know it wasn't even on my radar it wasn't even something worth uh, spending a lot of time talking about and then I was invited to go to Toronto and speak as a guest of CFI there and spent um, several days talking with the national director for CFI and the idea started forming and it seemed like you know it was a it was a good fit because a lot of of the ideas and and um, oh I don't want to say belief systems but a lot of the things that CFI advocates for I passionately believe in so my fiance had the opportunity to, to uh, she got offered a job here in Calgary and and I moved here and uh, it just was a good fit. It worked and uh, so I took over. It's been almost a year now that I've been here and we've had a lot of strong uh, speakers come and you know talk on various topics, including Michael Shermer. We had him here late last year and he was actually talking on this topic that he, he wrote this new book on. Uh, the believing so, brain. Yeah, but I don't know. He didn't even talk about that he had that book coming out then, but but that was it just happened to be the topic of his speech. So we've had some really interesting people come here and, and give talks. We we had uh, PZ Myers here and and uh, Richard Carrier and and so I keep beating the bushes trying to find people willing to come and and uh, express that idea. And I don't know if you guys realize it, but Calgary is. You know, the province of Alberta is considered the Texas of of Canada. I didn't know that. I can see that. I preached a lot in Calgary, Edmonton, uh, Fort McMurray yeah. back in my preaching days. Very, very conservative. But if you were to to place Canada on the continuum, you know, of conservative to liberal, Canada is generally overall more liberal than the states. But uh, Alberta is extremely conservative. We're like in the middle of it here trying to set up a, a secular, humanist, agnostic, atheist community here in Calgary. So it's a challenge, but I love it. What you're doing and talking about setting up a community, that's one of the things Michael Shermer uh, really uh, impressed upon us is there must be an atheist, agnostic, humanist community because people are going to move from one community to another only when they're confident in that community that they're moving to, unless they're like yourself, just brave. Uh, as we were discussing earlier, you've got to have balls of brass to have done what you did, but not everybody does. Your average person is going to be looking for a community that is in line with their way of thinking, and what you're doing is creating that community. Yeah, and, th and that's probably the most important thing in my mind as far as what CFI can do, because certainly we can bring people in who can, can advocate very effectively for different ideas. But, you know, I believe from my own experience that there are a lot of people out there who, you know, they listen to their preacher on Sunday and they go, eh, yeah, whatever. Yeah, it's a good idea for us to talk about how to be kinder to each other and the social ideas that come up, those are solid. Uh, but, you know, I just don't think I want to let go of this because there's too much opportunity for community and for uh, socializing and for feeling good about myself uh, that doesn't really address the question of whether or not there's a God. So I'm, I'm going to hang on to this. And when you let go of that, or when you struggle with that question, those thoughts of community start, you know, they're, they're dominant. They were for me. And, and I know how important that was for me. So that's one of the main focuses that I have here at CFI. And we recently, in fact, just last month, um, Calgary became only the second city 
uh, in Canada. I think Toronto was the first one that did it, but we had a couple of gals were, were named to the University of Calgary's uh, multi-faith chaplaincy that we, we now have a, a secular humanist chaplaincy seat here at the University of Calgary. So awesome. that's a precursor to uh, creating um, secular humanist, uh, if you want to say, uh, ministers for you know marriage ceremonies and that kind of stuff. Those kind of things are the things we have to have so that people can more seamlessly transition from you know one belief system to another. That's exactly what we need. You know, we were just talking about the lack of humanist chaplains uh, when I was in the hospital recently, because a chaplain doesn't just come and pray and talk to you. They, you know, they also tend to be people who kind of know how to get things done around the hospital. They know that if you need help with something, they can go find the head nurse and the head nurse will help tell you how to do what you're trying to do. They know where to find the extra towels. They can sit and talk with you and you can just, you know, talk out your problems. They're, they they fulfill a very comforting, supportive role. And, uh, you know, to have that without the gods in it, that's a worthy goal. That's something that we would love to see more of in the world. Congratulations. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. These gals that did it are, you know, highly motivated, intelligent um, women. And I think they're going to do a remarkable job. That's great. Isn't it a shame that the religious raising we were a part of thought that keeping women quote in their place was the right thing and uh, here we see when women are allowed that uh, they can make their place wherever they damn well please don't even get me started on that <laughs> <laughs> I, you know that that's probably well i don't want to prioritize it or give it a hierarchy but that's a huge part of the belief system that i grew up with that is so destructive not only for individuals but for the community as a whole when you you take that such critical um, aspect of the community and you tamp it down or you you uh, prevent it from being as effective as it can be you know I, I think it's uh, Hitchens talks about uh, the the answer the solution to poverty throughout the world is to give women uh, power to give them the opportunity to excel in commerce and other areas of life and it raises the floor for the entire community so uh, i couldn't agree more with you on that rich that's a wonderful way to put it and uh as a woman i wholly agree i recognize how amazingly lucky i am to have grown up in uh, not only a liberal uh, part of the country but uh, a liberal city a place where i mean i can have whatever job i want and you know, I sometimes I, I joke that uh, Rich is, is the attraction in this podcast and, you know, it's all his big ideas and I'm just the support system. But And we both know that's not really the case. <laughs> I, I received my first you're a strong atheist woman compliment the other day and I just glowed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, but That's it sounds great. like you've really embraced the humanist values. And I i am a huge fan because that really is kind of the exact opposite. It's the antidote to the WBCs of the world because to them, women, minorities, gays are all not really human. And to a humanist, everybody is equal and deserving of love and support and acceptance. And I think it's a wonderful place to have landed. And it wasn't a reaction. It was, you know, I mean, early on, a lot of my ideas that were not well thought out were basically, you know, what does my father think? And I'm going to deliberately think the opposite. And I found that that actually served me quite well. But, yeah. but ultimately, the decisions I came to were, were well considered, well read. Uh, they weren't hasty decisions. You know, I mean, I grew up certain that, that homosexuals were were uh, subhuman. And when you think about the kind of destructive effect that kind of thinking has, on humans, you know, once once you can take away their humanity, the, you know, those attributes, of, then it becomes easier to mistreat them and to ultimately to destroy them, which we've seen so much of in, in our history, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, when I look at it from the from the perspective of a humanist, I can only conclude that we have no right, we have no authority, moral or otherwise, to treat 
one member of this species different from another. I'm very comfortable with my uh, support of, of those groups. We understand you've got a book coming out. Tell us about it. Well, it is still only a, uh, a vision because we haven't got someone uh, saying that they'll publish it yet, but we're, we're well on our way. I'm working with a literary agent down in, in Mississippi, actually, and, and we're putting together the, the proposal. We're in the final stages of that, in fact. Excellent. And hopefully we can find a, a publisher, you know, once we get that proposal finalized and, and out there. Well, we have a vision, too, so we uh, understand where you're at with that. <laughs> I don't think you're going to have any trouble finding a publisher when we let some of our closest friends know that we were going to be talking with you. Uh, we were just overwhelmed with, uh, wow, I really want to hear what this man has to say. So uh, I am pretty certain that you will uh, not have a hard time finding someone who will help you do that. Amen. Do you have any relationship with your family at all anymore? Well, you know, I spent 25 years working with my brother, Mark, who he was actually the trailblazer. He was the first one who left and stayed gone. Um, so I still have a good relationship with him. Uh, and then my younger sister, Dortha, had also left I didn't really know her that well growing up because she was so many years younger than me. Uh, but her and I have managed to cobble together a, a, a long distance relationship. And uh, so there's, there's that. But as far as the ones that are still in that church, they're not allowed to. And they have embraced my father's ideology enough that as far as they're concerned, I'm evil. So there's just, there's no foundation or there's no, ability for a relationship with any of them anymore and i want to ask this question because we've been asked it on facebook when we said we were going to be talking with you uh, and people incredulously stated isn't family stronger than belief how can people reject someone that is family and that they love over something like belief and that's a good question and i talk a lot about that in my book because what people need to understand as frightening as the idea of an atheist is to a strong believer they have to understand that these ideas aren't pulled out of the air by fundamentalist groups like my father it's in the Bible and the Bible advocates for the destruction of family ties in service to the relationship with God and my father embraced that completely and so many of his ideas which come you know they have their roots in the Bible are so counter to uh, a strong family and a strong community. And just because most Christians and most religions have figured out how to tamp down those, those aspects, those messages in the Bible, doesn't mean they're not there and doesn't mean that people aren't given the opportunity to use them to uh, destroy families. Wow. That is, that's just powerful. It's an excellent point. Where do you see the future of Nate Phelps? I mean, your life is a story of overcoming. Is there anything out there you don't feel like you could? Well, no, I want to ask that a better way. What is out there that you're going to overcome uh, before your 42 years are over, by the way? <laughs> yeah, that, that ship has sailed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, you know, I feel like I'm living on borrowed time now because 2000 came and went and, and we're still here. Yeah, May 21st came and went. What happened with that? Oh, well, we've got October 21st. Still. That's true. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. And then my family is, is um, well, they won't specifically call it that date. Uh, Shirley has, has set um, July 22nd of next year as, as a pivotal day in, in this whole process of Christ returning. So. You know, there's a lot of that, a lot of those days scheduled between here and the end of next year. So it'll be exciting to watch. But, but uh, what I what I am hopeful for and will continue to give my voice to is this idea that there are a lot of people out there who are on the fence, who are are questioning their faith. You know, when I see these polls that say there's a certain percentage of Americans that that are religious, I just don't buy it, you guys. I think there are a lot of people out there who are where we were at some point in our journey who if given the opportunity to uh, see a, another path will take it and uh, that's what i want to work for I, and you know I, I don't i don't want to make it sound like I, i'm proselytizing i think that that's the natural 
thinking that, that humans would have if they weren't affected by the environment or the community or society that they live in. I think it's much better for the, the security of our future if we let go of all this mythology that drives us to kill each other. Um, so that's, that's the future I envision is we get better at becoming uh, secular humanists in this world. I love that. That's wonderful. And that's, you know, the kind of thing that we're trying to work for, too. I think community is, is a huge part. We want everybody to be brought together by shared, positive, evidence-based beliefs, not torn apart by mythology, as you said. Uh, speaking of torn apart, uh, I read your blog post about uh, the KKK versus the Westboro Baptist Church, oh, and I thought yeah. you had some really great insights uh, into uh, the, the the protest and the counter protest there. I wonder if you could share just a tiny bit of uh, of what you said in that for our listeners, and we'll make sure and link to that post. You know, it just seems like they're where they are more than willing to be outspoken and, and outrageous in their viewpoints. It's like they hedge their bets sometimes. And I don't know if that was Abby's intent or not, but but the suggestion of that comment was that they didn't, they didn't hold um, blacks and women in the same low esteem that they hold gays. And that simply is not true. You know, my father taught clearly as we were growing up, and you know, he was raised in the deep south of Mississippi, so he brought whatever those prejudices came from that environment with him. Uh, he, he made no bones about it that blacks were second-class citizens because of you know what uh, Noah's son Ham did in the Bible. So you know, he was justified in his thinking that that blacks were inferior, that they were cursed by God, and and most likely there weren't going to be too many of them in heaven. And, and then his, his whole attitude towards women, you know, from the physical and, and, uh, and psychological violence that he imposed on his wife um, to, you know, just pounding those passages from the New Testament into our head week in and week out that women were to be in subjection to their husbands, that they were, you know, that Eve was uh, deceived by the snake in the Garden of Eden and and therefore women were to be in subjection and, to, and they were second class citizens. So it's just nonsense for, for her to imply that they live with an ideology that, that women and, and minorities are, are equal to uh, you know, the believers. So I just thought it was important for people to understand that it, they, it was a subtle twist the way she said it, she didn't come right out and say, we don't believe that blacks are, are going to hell, but that's what they believe. And I think that they ought to be called on that kind of duplicity. I think that was a really great point because I saw that statement and I was like, that's awfully liberal for them. I did something a little weird about they're not, you know, women and blacks are not an abomination in the Bible, but it's all weasel words. And you saw right through it and, and explained it. I think people should uh, pay more attention to what you write. Yeah, oh, thank you. The uh, work you're doing with CFI dovetails very nicely with the missions that we have and, and we've been talking about. About. So, yeah, you know, there'll be plenty of, uh, of room for collaboration and, and more talking in the future. Yeah, and that's one of my goals for this next year is to, to actually start a freedom or living without religion branch here in, in Calgary because, like I said, it just seemed so powerfully supportive when I sat in on that one in Toronto. And, and uh, I really believe that it's helpful to people. You know, it's easy to fall into, you know, religion bashing when you're in that kind of environment. But you know, there were people who came up with some really profound thoughts and ideas that, that we got to consider and, and talk about in that in that uh, one meeting that I sat in on. So I think it'll be good for us to have something like that here. Yeah, I'd love to have one uh, in our area, too. You know, we don't have a CFI in Seattle, but I think it's a very ripe place for that at some time in the future. Yeah, I'm a little surprised to hear that because Vancouver is like very, um, it's probably the richest community here in, in Canada as far as the skeptics and, and the free thinkers. Let's talk about a question that Deanna wanted to ask earlier and I wanted to kind of wait to. What is life like today for Nate Phelps? Do you have confidence? Do you feel that you have come into your own? And when you look back at the life you had compared to the life you have now, kind of talk about that with us. Yes and no. I mean, there, there are aspects of my life 
you know, I went through a, a, a difficult divorce about five years ago, and that, that can shake anybody's foundation. And uh, so, you know, there, there's some areas where I still feel like I'm, I'm regaining uh, my, my legs and uh, finding confidence. But I can say with complete certainty that, that a lot of those fears that I didn't even know I lived with, you know, that I couldn't define. There was just this vague, nebulous anxiety that always seemed to hang over me. A lot of those specific components I have completely let go of and I'm and I'm comfortable and excited about the future because I don't live any longer with a nagging question of whether or not I'm going to physically burn for an eternity after I die. And those kind of things are huge when you live with it for 40 plus years of your life, right? So there's huge progress. There's a lot of confidence that comes from that progress. And I continue down the path. I'm still on this journey and, and I'm excited about, I guess the best way to put it is that hope has returned. Thank you for listening to the Living After Faith podcast with Rich and Deanna Joy Lyons. Living After Faith is a podcast designed to help you as you leave religion and move forward with your life. We are the official podcast of RecoveringReligionists.com, a recovery group founded by Dr. Daryl Ray, the author of The God Virus. The music for this show is provided by Morrison's Prophecy. See LivingAfterFaith.com for a link to more music from Morrison's Prophecy. We welcome your feedback, and you can find phone numbers and email addresses at Living After Faith faith.com at facebook.com slash living after faith and follow us on twitter at laf with me